Michelle Paver is a children's writer, best known for her books Wolf Brother and Viper's Daughter. In 2009, her book Ghost Hunter, the concluding part of her fantasy series Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, won the Guardian Children's Fiction Prize. Michelle spoke recently to Nikki Gamble about her most recent title, Skin Taker, and her future book plans. For our listeners, I think it would be a really good place to start if we could talk to them a little bit about where we had left those wonderful characters that we've all grown to love, Torak, Wren and Wolf. For those of you who you know, have read the, the, the original series, you know, Viper's daughter caught up um, two summers after the last book, Ghost Hunter, ended, standalone story. Um, without saying too much about Viper's daughter, it had taken Wren and Torak and Wolf up to the far north and then beyond to the edge of the world. Uh, I'd finally got them back from there and they were back in the forest at the end of uh, Viper's daughter. But the antagonist, I perhaps don't want to give away his name because that's a bit of a spoiler for Viper's daughter, but Wren has just discovered at the end of Viper's daughter that the, the baddie is still around. Um, and so that left things open uh, as we went into the autumn months um, for Skin Taker, which then picks up in the deep winter, in the dark time. Mm -hmm. There's a very dramatic beginning to this story. That's right. Well, thank you. It it starts with a bang, Skin Taker. Um, A meteorite devastates the forest to Torak and Ren. It's the Thunderstar. And this is in the dark time probably the worst time, the midwinter, to to be devastated by a meteorite. Um, The clans are in turmoil. Some of them have been obliterated. Many are just struggling for survival. Do they they come together or do they turn on each other? Um, Demons are thriving, of course, in the darkness. Bears have been woken from their winter sleep and they're prowling the forest. And that's got problems for Torak because his father was killed by a bear. Um, back in Wolf Brother. And it falls to Torak and Wren and Wolf to save the forest because the forest itself is threatened. Do we know whether there were meteorite showers that were catastrophic during that period of prehistory? To my knowledge, we don't know about 6,000 years ago, which is Torak's time, whether there's a specific one. I don't know about that. Um, I certainly based this meteorite, the Thunderstar, on a particular meteorite. That was back in 1908, I think, the Tunguska meteorite in Siberia. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the reason I did that was partly because it devastated a forest, but also because there are some wonderful first-hand accounts from nomadic people who live in traditional ways, the Evenk people. Um, And so their, their mindset is similar to Torax people, because I've based Torax clans on people who live in traditional ways. And so it was wonderful to be able to read their accounts. I mean, th- those accounts were actually many years after they'd seen the meteorite. But it's so vivid. I mean, I remember there was one um, woman who described, she said, I saw a whirlwind dancing. And I think I, I used that, <laughs> you know, in, in the in the story, because it was a very much a very strong impression and also that you know the fact that some of them who weren't actually killed the reindeer hides that they were wearing were blown off them or were burnt and there was a smell of sort of singed reindeer hide and things uh, and so it's very very vivid and, and mm. I used quite a lot of it for that. Mm. <laughs> it's amazing mental imagery throughout uh, this book. Um, first of all I just wanted to get into a little bit of the prehistory idea as you've already said six six thousand years ago Mm. uh in some ways that's recent history of the earth but in history of humans it feels like a long time ago and i do know that you're very assiduous with your research (laughs) so i wondered what evidence you've been able to use along with your imagination obviously to create the very similitude of you know this whole prehistoric period you mean the sort of archaeological evidence? Mm. Yes, yes. Well, I think the archaeology has helped me mostly in terms of the weapons and the technology, because that's what has survived. Um, so, for example, the use of woven bark uh, and material to, to make nets, for example, in, in the Helsinki Museum, 
National Museum, there's an amazing Stone Age net, which is enormous. It's it's yards long, made of woven bark, all carefully sort of woven together. And, and then, of course, we have the flints. And um, there I was very careful because Torex time is the Mesolithic, the later Stone Age. So they use what's called microliths, which are sort of flakes of flint set in, say, bone or antler, rather than just one big piece of flint, which actually wouldn't work that well as, as a knife. So that's the sort of archaeological evidence. But then, of course, to put the flesh on the bones, as it were, is, is you really have to go for, you know, what, what's the belief system? And there we have very little to go on because they mm. didn't leave, as far as we know, they didn't leave writing. Mm. Um, so it's a combination of archaeology and anthropology mm. um, to, I hope, create a authentic, different hunter-gatherer cultures. Some nice, some not so nice. <laughs> We'll come to some of those differences because I want to talk about the, I mean, I don't think society is probably quite the right word, but I want to talk about the relationship of those clans go through, which I think is really interesting. But I'm going to stick with setting uh, uh, to begin with. And there are two settings that are particularly important and so beautifully realised in Skin Taker, the caves and the forest. And I wanted to talk about the caves probably because I need to exercise my fears honestly oh. I was my heart was <laughs> racing in that bit because I'm terrified of being trapped underground and I know that you were guided through some deep caves I couldn't believe when I read your author's note that you actually <laughs> followed that caver through the gap yes. I mean can you tell us about that experience yeah that was quite unexpected I, I'd a very nice man who runs a, a, a show cave and and some mines in Gloucestershire in the forest of Dean, Clearwell Caves. He, he's agreed to take me down the caves for, for a day. Fantastic. And we got down some pretty steep stairs into this cave with you know flashlights on. It's all a bit slippery and red because it's very oxide earth blood in in the story. And then Jonathan the guide showed me this tiny little, it looked like a rabbit hole, slightly bigger than my head, not quite as broad broad as my shoulders, and I'm not enormous. And he slithered through it. (laughs) And I thought, well, we haven't even started, so I can't turn back. And it was so low that he, he said you had to lie on your tummy and push with your toes and then put one arm forward and one arm back so your shoulders are slanted. And after about 10 feet, I got through. Then we had a lovely few hours exploring these much bigger caves. But always at the back of my mind was the thought, yeah, but there is only one way out. You Um, are so (laughs) intrepid. Honestly, I'm in complete admiration. I think I was just Now, there's something that comes up in the the story. It's Dark who who is in the tunnel. Yes. And he talks about the dizziness in the darkness. I was quite surprised Mm. by that because Mm. I've always thought that your balance is maintained by your ears rather than your eyes. I've thought so too, but this is the advantage of being with someone. I mean, Jonathan, who, who you know owns the cave, and he said, now let's we switch off the lights and just experience total darkness. And it was really disorienting. And he said, this is why, you, you know, if you are in total darkness, you crawl and you go slowly. That's the key thing, because you really do get disoriented. So I think I think balance and, you know, what they call proprioception, which is the body telling itself where it is in the world, is actually much more complicated than just sight and ears. This is why I do the research. Research gives me things that I can't imagine, and it gives me ideas for the story. The other setting, if you like, that's hugely important is the forest and in particular trees. Mm. Torak and Wren embark on this quest. Uh, They have to go deep into the forest to find a stone that they need for a ritual to restore the first tree. And as I was reading, I was aware of how our knowledge and appreciation of trees has really deepened over recent years. There certainly seems to be more public awareness now than when you wrote Wolf Brother, for instance, I would say. Mm. And I felt that the story fitted very well with ideas of rewilding, rediscovering a relationship with our knowledge of trees that might once have been known but has been lost or forgotten. I wondered whether you carried any of that with you uh, as you were writing well, you know, I think I think that was very much um, in the subconscious because I certainly don't ever write with a message uh, because 
I, I'm very aware that, well, certainly when I was sort of between eight and 12, which is kind of the core readership, obviously older people read these books as well. But yeah, you know, I, I could smell out a story that was written with a message, you know, in a heartbeat and I would throw it across the room and that was it. I did not want to be taught. But having said that, you know, attitudes, my attitude, the attitude of the hunter gatherers in the story, which is based on real hunter gatherers, comes through in the stories so it's not surprising um, that there is a sort of resonance there the thing that that I think was accidental but I was quite pleased about was at the one point Torak spirit walks in in the trees and right from Chronicles days you know I think it was the fifth book Oathbreaker when he first spirit walks in the trees I had this idea that all the trees are linked you know their souls move around so you know when his spirit walks in one tree he's far he's going through all the others and it's all this vast web of consciousness um which i develop in in skin taker you know and it all gets a bit scary because how does he get back to his body and you know it's only recently this this year that i've been reading about you know what they call the world wide wide you know root web sort of thing of that trees are actually linked and that a forest is a sort of organism in its own right. I don't think I knew about that, but I'm I'm glad that I was sort of along the right lines. <laughs> While we're talking about observation, uh, I'm hugely appreciative of your descriptive writing. It creates such oh, vivid you. mental imagery for the reader. Um, in this book, I was particularly struck by your attention to sound. And I imagine that you spend as much time listening as you do observing when you're on your research trips. And I wonder what sorts of things about the soundscape of the far north have lodged in your imagination. Oh, it's it's you're absolutely right. And that's why I never I don't really take a camera because it's not no use. You know, I don't take pictures. It's it's just got a little notebook because sounds are so important. It's the sound of it's not really a crunch, but, you know, when you put your foot through a sort of snow crust um, and it's sort of echoes and it's it's a cold sound. And then the echo of water down a cave, um, the different sounds that trees make, you know, pines have a sort of roaring sound. Poplars have a sort of chattering sound, all those different sounds, the croak of a raven, those sorts of sounds. And of course, Torak as a hunter um, is very attuned to listening in the forest uh, he's got to pick up all sorts of sounds because you know you can't see that far in a forest um, and the whole idea of this though let less people think that this is all a sort of archaeological tract I mean you know these are adventure stories so the, the whole aim of all this research is to make the reader feel that they are there it would be really lovely to hear uh, a bit of the story Michelle so I think you're going to read uh, from part way through Uh, Tell us a little bit about the section you're going to read to us. Sure. Well, it's just a couple of pages when um, Torak and Wren and Wolf are in the forest, um, the unburnt bit of the forest, and they've come upon a bear who's guarding a a roebuck, a deer that it's just killed. Uh, And Torak, who, it has to be said, has been acting rather unlike himself since the meteorite struck. He's decided that since they're rather hungry, He's going to do what he you never should do. He's decided to go and steal part of the bear's kill. With a startled pfft, the bear rose to its full height and stared at Torak. It's my kill now, he yelled, brandishing his axe as he ran towards the carcass. Go away. The bear had never seen a human act like this. Dropping to all fours, it bounded off then turned and gave an uncertain snort, sliding out its tongue to taste his scent. What was this creature who was trying to steal its kill? Go away, bellowed Torak, grabbing the buck's leg and hacking at the joint. The flesh was frozen stiff. He couldn't cut through. He was dimly aware of Wolf snarling, advancing on the bear, and Wren waving her axe and screaming. Soon the bear would realise he was bluffing. It would be on him in a single leap. The hump of muscle between the bear's shoulders swayed as it shifted from side to side. One massive forepaw slapped the ground. It champed its jaws with a noise like rocks clashing. 
baring its fangs, it roared, that's my kill, mine. The last strip of hide snapped. Torak wrenched the haunch loose. Run, he shouted at Wren. No one can outrun a bear, especially not in twilight, down a snow-covered slope choked with fallen trees. Torak couldn't see Wren. She had to be somewhere below. He caught a blur as a wolf hurtled past, heading uphill towards the bear. Torak spun round to help. The bear was slashing at Wolf, who'd circled behind to distract it from his pack brother. Torak saw Wolf dodge its claws, dart in, sink his teeth into its rump. The outraged bear gave a roar that shook the forest. Again, Wolf dodged the great claws that could gut him at a stroke. Now he was backing towards the carcass, snarling, goading the bear into following him to protect its kill. Wolf shot Torak a look, run. But Torak went after them, he couldn't leave his pack brother. And yet, if he attacked the bear with his axe, he might hit Wolf. Uff, Wolf told him frantically, run. Again, the bear turned on Torak. Again, Wolf darted in to nip its rump. This time, the bear ignored him. It was rocking from forepaw to forepaw, torn between the lust to tear Torak limb from limb and the urge to save its kill from this impudent wolf. Greed won. It galloped after wolf. Torak saw his pack brother racing uphill, the bear chasing at appalling speed. Wolf leapt over the carcass and vanished into the dark. The bear roared, flinging branches, overturning boulders. This is my kill. The last Torak saw of it. It was prowling about the roebuck, huffing and clashing its jaws as it guarded its prize. Torak breathed out. Savage laughter bubbled in his throat and became a sob. He began to shake. Flashes came at him from five winters ago, the demon bear erupting from the dark, his father lying dying in the wreck of the shelter, clutching his hand. Torak swallowed hard. Hoisting the buck's haunch on his shoulder, he started downhill to find Wren. Mm -hmm. It's certainly action-packed, but it's also very moving because uh, Torak has been affected by this meteorite yes. strike in a way that we we would perhaps describe as a depression he, it's the black yes. web has come yes. upon him and he can't really feel anything he's desperate to uh, restore some kind of emotion and sensation that, that's exactly right and and in fact um, I mean there is depression in my family and, and uh, I modeled the black web that you're absolutely right it is depression because he's He's been much closer to the forest than anyone else. He has spirit walked in the trees. And so when it's devastated, he is devastated too. And as you say, he's that's why he's been acting strangely, to, to provoke some sensation in him, to break clear of the black web. And of course, it's backfired on him. Mm. Also very moving, the way that Wolf just steps in. Yes. No instinct for his own safety but just to save his pack brother basically Absolutely. wolf is loyalty personified um he will do anything for his pack brother and i think i think children find that very reassuring so do adults it's that sort of lost bond that we'd all like with a wild animal well i would certainly mm. Although the story is set 6,000 years ago, as we keep mm. saying, I was struck by how current the challenges facing the people in this story are. There seems to be a sort of beginning of social stratification. I was really interested in the stark contrast of perceptions between the Red Deer clan and the Kelps, for instance. Yeah, I mean, I, I did really, right from the start of these books, I wanted to make different clans different because they are you know, different nationalities are, they, they are different without wanting to stereotype too much. And um, the Red Deer clan are quite religious and they're sort of faith-based and their faith has been completely shaken by the Thunderstar. Whereas you've got the Kelp clan who come, I'll have more to say about the Kelp clan in, in Wolfbane, the last book, um, but they're very keen on wolves because actually they don't have any wolves on their island. Mm. 
And so they they try to look like wolves. You know, they squeeze their heads um, when they're babies to make them narrow like wolves and they file their teeth, both of which are based on, you know, real, real tribes. Um, and it gives the world a texture, you know, and, and everybody has a different approach to why this disaster has happened, which, of course, as you say, you know, yes, it's 6,000 years ago, but we're still grappling with that, mm. um, as we know, and different people are coming up with different responses. But uh, it helps to make it a rich story, I think, when you have that sort of thing. And then, you know, if children just want to follow the story, that's fine. But I have noticed that, you know, young adult readers pick up on that, mm. you know, uh, particularly if, if, you know, that what they're seeing on the Internet. And I think I was quite informed by, you know, what was happening with Donald Trump and everything and, you know, the way he was whipping up um, uh, his supporters. Uh, mm. that, that certainly went into the deep forest clans being under the sway of the baddie. <laughs> well, there's something there about you've got more to fear. I think Vin Kedin says you, it's the people you need to fear. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Demons are one thing, but, you know, when, when Tarek and Ren go into the deep forest, it's the people you will have to fear the most. There's a a, a little bit in this story about the emergence of stories themselves yes. and new mythologies being made. Yeah. Um, and although we've said that peoples can um, butt up against each other, they can also learn to come together and create a positive story. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think because, you know, this is this is quite a dark story in, in real terms because it's a dark time when the sun doesn't climb above the horizon for, for a lot of it. And you know, dark things are happening. But I'm very aware that I am writing mostly for children. And my sort of guiding principle is I don't want any child to come out of one of these books feeling worse about the world. I want them to feel good about the world because I think that's what children's literature should do. Um, you can take them to dark places, but give them hope. So that's why the importance of Wolf. You know, I see him as a sort of golden thread. You know, his relationship mm -hmm. with Torak running through the darkness and everything. And with this idea, yes, you know, do the clans turn on each other and blame each other, as you say, or do they come together? And Finn Kedin, who is in a sense the sort of moral leader in the stories, you know, the father figure, um, is very much for bringing people, bringing the survivors together. And he, he, he tells a story. He's a great storyteller. And he tells a story which I actually based on, I think, a, a sort of legend from the Pacific Northwest clans, um, of how in the old times, because of course, even in the Stone Age, they had their memories of the old times, there was a terrible flood and all the animals and the people got together to build a raft. And I love that story. I adapted it slightly, but it's, and it sort of gives people hope. And I hope it gives the reader hope as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it also has things to say about the importance of storytelling. The importance of storytelling, the importance of positive storytelling, because yes. I think the narratives that we tell can actually help to shape the future. If you tell positive stories, you are more likely to lead to positive outcomes than if you keep telling negative stories. Oh, yes. That telling of the story, and it has, happens early on in the book, it's not a spoiler, um, is what motivates people, gives them some hope, even the naysayers, that even in this darkness, things can get better and they sort of do. I, that's, I don't want to say <laughs> too we, much. Well, but, uh, yes, we've still got another story to go. They're bound oh, yes. to get worse again somewhere. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I must ask you, um, we haven't talked about wolf and the animals, and I do hope that we'll be able to pick that up again. But I do want to ask you a question mm. about whether you ever reread your books, whether you've gone back and read Wolf Brother, for instance. How long is it since uh, you wrote that? Well, I wrote it in 2003. It was published in 2004. The sixth book, Ghost Hunter, which I thought was going to be the last, came out in 2009. And after that, I didn't reread them. I never reread my books. Mm. But then to answer your question, yes, I did reread the whole six books when I had the idea for what is now the trilogy, you know, Viper's Daughter, Skin Taker, and soon to be Wolfbane. Because I had to for continuity, you know, um, because of course I had the main things in my mind, but there's so much detail in these books and there were so many, you know, events. And, and I partly reread them to remind myself of what Tarak and Wren and Wolf had been through because, you know, I 
I like things to have a consequence. And, you know, Ren had been through certain things to do with her family. I won't, you know, too many spoilers, but, and those have a direct result on Viper's daughter and what she's going through in Viper's daughter. So yeah, I spent, I spent a month rereading them and then doing continuity notes. What was it like revisiting your work from nearly 20 years ago? You're still writing a continuation of that story. And you have, as we've evidenced in this podcast, you've accumulated Mm. so much knowledge and experience about this world along the way that can't have been there at the beginning. Uh, So what was it like revisiting? Oh, I don't want to sound too smug, but there was nothing huge that I thought, oh, gosh, that, you know, that's jarring. You know, I've needed to change that. So that I'm very pleased with that those essential principles remain the same. I think the characters are, you know, they've, they've grown and obviously deepened, but there's nothing that completely jars. So again, I, I don't want to sound too smug, but you know, that I was quite pleased. I was quite pleased. I, I was also, I have to say a little bit daunted um, because I wasn't sure if I could bring something fresh enough to to for the three books. Um, but then I had, as I said, you know, reckoned without the inexhaustible inventiveness of hunter gatherer cultures. Mm. Uh, they, they really, you know, when I went to Siberia to, to research out of Siberia to research Viper's daughter, you know, and, and got to know some of the Chukchi, I just thought this is totally different. And it's so rich. Um, and there's so much that I can do with this, you know, um, which is why I'm glad I had three books. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that you felt uh, um, relief as you went back and reread. Yeah, um, I did. Um, I did. Previous uh, work and the characters remain really strong. Um, I'm, we haven't talked so much about the main characters today. Mm. I hope we get the opportunity to do that when we come to the kind of conclusion of their story yes, yes. in the next book <laughs> uh, but for now let's just call it a pause with part two coming up sometime next year yes. I'd just like to thank you so much for talking to me today Michelle it's been an absolute pleasure oh likewise it's been so nice to revisit this thank you so much Nikki In the Reading Corner is presented by Nikki Gamble and produced by Alison Hughes If you have enjoyed this podcast, please do leave a review for us. To find out about other projects, including an audience with events and the Exploring Children's Literature Summer School, visit www.exploringchildrensliterature.uk. Join us again soon in the Reading Corner on your favourite podcast platform.